Hey there, family. You know, I was uh, reading the Bible the other day, and, and I realized there's so many stories that are so important, so many stories in the Bible that are so crucial for you and I. You know, one of which I just wanted to, uh, I was just thinking here today, and I wanted to just uh, think through it with you. The story, of course, of Elijah. Now, I know there's a, a whole lot of things that happen with the prophet Elijah, right? But, you know, just to do a little context, you know, before we dive in, you know, the, the story I want us to focus on today is the story of Elijah and his encounter with the prophets of Baal. You all know the story. But before I get into the story, let's look at the, the context, all right? God's people, the nation of Israel, you remember how many tribes they were? There were 12 tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel, okay? Over time, however, those tribes, those people ended up taking their eyes off of God, their eyes off of heaven and, his, and, and, and the holy things of God. They started to, to look to, to others for, for help. The Egyptians, the, you know, what have you, the Assyrians, you know, whatever nations were out there. There was a lot of war going on and they ended up even making war among themselves. And these 12 tribes ended up clashing and fighting with each other and dividing and basically turning on each other. So these 12 tribes split. Ten of those tribes became known as the Northern Kingdom, and they took the name of Israel, right? And then you had the tribe, the, the other two tribes that stuck together and took the name Judah. So you have Israel and you have Judah. Now, it, uh, Judah was composed of the two tribes, the Levites and the Benjamites. Of course, they were the ones who ran the sanctuary, the Levites. So the sanctuary services continued, at least for a time, with them, with Judah. Now, Jeroboam arrived on the scene. He was a king, a wicked king. And to keep the people from traveling over to, to Jerusalem, to Judah, to do those sacrifices on the, you know, the sanctuary, he brought in and established idol worship, pagan worship, to keep the people there and not going over to, to Jerusalem. And they started to worship the gods of the pagans. Also, the Assyrians, probably the most powerful, you know, meanest, strongest tribe of um, nation at that particular time, showed up on the scene, right? And they were the cruelest people you can imagine. They would come in, they would conquer a, a nation, they would conquer a land, and then they would tell you, hey, we're big and strong. You better do what we say, so we or else we we might end up, uh, you know, we might end up hurting you, destroying you, deporting you to other lands. And of course, they would demand gold and silver, but not just gold and silver. They would also say, "You have to worship our gods, or else." And of course, um, Israel was the first of the two that had to deal with uh, the Assyrians and this threat. And they started worshiping the pagan gods of the Assyrians. Later, by the time we pick up the story here with Elijah, old King Ahab and his evil, wicked wife, Jezebel, they had established not only just any old worship of gods, but Baal worship. Okay? He himself, King Ahab, took part in, in Baal worship. Now, Baal was known as the god of the rain and the thunder. And, you know. So one day, Elijah walks up into the palace and says, hey, you guys are attributing the rain to this fake pagan god. What's all this about? You know what? God, Jehovah, the true God, says that it's not going to rain for three years. And that's exactly what happened? The rain stopped. And as you can imagine, that made the people, King Ahab and all his subjects, 
very upset. Because without water, without rain, you can't grow crops, you can't live, you can't do anything. So, and then Elijah just disappears. The Holy Spirit, God, you know, whisks him away. So the people are just going crazy. You can imagine there's wanted posters with Elijah's face on them everywhere for three years. He's on the move, he's on the run. And as you can imagine, Jezebel and, and the king are angry. They're looking, are hunting for him. They, they go and they kill the other prophets of God. Sadly, you know, that's it's so terrible. In the meantime, Elijah gets involved in all types of uh, adventures. God, you know, working miracles and using him mightily. One day he says, all right, it's time to go back and meet with old King Ahab and confront him. Because his wife and them, they're, they're worshiping these evil gods and, and they're giving glory and credit to this fake God and they're putting to death the prophets of Jehovah. So he finally shows up. He, he, he finds uh, Obadiah. Uh, uh, Obadiah is a follower of Jehovah. Of course, uh, there were still followers of Jehovah there, but they had to lay low. You know, they had to watch themselves. So... He, runs, he finds Obadiah, Elijah, and tells him, hey, go and tell King Ahab, <clears throat> go and tell King Ahab that I want to meet with him. All right? Of course, Obadiah says, man, are you crazy? You want me to go over there? And, and, and I mean, they've been looking for you for the past, uh, what, three years, and there's no rain. They, they want to kill you. If I go and, and I tell them that, hey, I, I actually was talking with Elijah, the guy you're hunting. And, uh, I mean, you have a knack, Elijah. You have a knack for disappearing. What if I go and I tell, tell the king, hey, I, I, I'm, Elijah wants to meet with you, and then God whisks you away somewhere. He, you're going to get me killed. So Elijah says, hey, don't worry. Just do what I say. Tell the king, I, I, I promise you, as the Lord now lives, I will meet with the king. I'm not going to go anywhere. So Obadiah. Trust the word of the prophet, and he goes, and he he tells the king Elijah wants to meet with him, and sure enough, Elijah goes. He meets with the king. He tells him, "Hey, I want you to gather all of these fake prophets of yours that believe in all this nonsense, these uh, pagan gods, okay? And I want you all and all the people of Israel to come out to Mount Carmel." Okay. And I, I, he tells them the, the classic words. How long will you wa waver? How long will you dilly-dally between two opinions? If God is the true God, serve him. If he's not, if Baal is the true God, then serve him. But you guys, you know the truth. You know the, 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 the one true God. But you want to, to worship these false gods. Bring your little false prophets out, and we're gonna we're gonna have a little challenge, okay? So they go, all the people gather, and then the, the, the prophets of Baal, which were about four hundred and fifty, and about four hundred other prophets. It's altogether about eight hundred and fifty prophets of these pagan gods, and of course the king and all his people, and everybody's there, and Elijah, of course. And about 7,000 or so Israelites, they're all there. And of course, you know the story, epic story. Elijah tells them, okay, whoever's God responds, okay, build an altar, first of all, and put a, a, a bull on the altar. Don't light it, okay? Do not burn the sacrifice yet. Just put the bull on the altar and call upon, we will both call upon our gods. And the God who responds by consuming the, off the offering with fire, well, then that will be God and we'll serve him. So the, the prophets actually, that's a, one of the things that, that kind of impresses me about these prophets, even though they're pagan, you know, evil guys, is that they say, yeah, sure, let's do it. They take him up on the challenge. Of course, they put up, they put up their, their altar. They start calling on Baal, nothing happens. 
calling on bow, calling on bow, nothing happens. Beating drums, beating themselves, cutting themselves, nothing happens. And of course, Elijah even starts to mock them by saying, hey, maybe your, uh, maybe your God is out there sleeping or maybe he's on a trip. Maybe you should scream a little louder. And they do. They scream at the top of their lungs as loud as they can. They start cutting themselves and hitting themselves, trying to get the attention of this, of this imposter God of theirs. And of course, nothing happens. Elijah then says, all right, you guys step back. You've had all day, and nothing happened. And he just, he, he, he sets up the altar. He calls the people to him. He says, let's, let's rebuild God's altar. He sets it up. He puts wood. The stones, 12 stones for the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay, so he still recognizes the 12. He, he doesn't play this, uh, this division game about, oh, there's 10 tribes over there and two over here. He puts the 12 stones for the 12 tribes. And then he prays his prayer. He puts, he puts the wood. He even douses the, the altar with water to the point where the, the, the trench around the altar is soaked, it's flooded with water. And then he, he prays a simple prayer. He calls upon God to manifest himself to show these stiff-necked people that there is only the one true God in heaven exists. And he's there and he's willing to answer. And of course, fire immediately comes down from heaven and consumes the altar, the burnt sacrifice. It even burns up the wood and the stones, and it laps up, it says, it laps up the water that was in the trench. And it just, I mean, I'm talking about just consumes it. Can you imagine what a sight that must have been to see fire come from the sky? You know, some say, hey, maybe, maybe it was it lightning, like maybe it could have been a, just a big bolt of lightning. Well, the Bible says it was fire. And nothing would be more impressive than to see fire come down from the sky and consume this altar and everything on it. And as you can imagine, all of those prophets are just in shock. And they, they have to give glory to Jehovah. Okay? Baal was supposed to be the god of the rain and the, the, the thunder and all this stuff. But God just showed them, hey. If your God's the one in charge of the rain and the water and the whatever, he's, he just put him in his place. And, of course, as you know, the story continues, and it gets pretty ugly. He ends up, uh, Elijah ends up calling the people to destroy, to kill, to execute those false prophets. Now, this, the, the main point from this story, family, that I, that I get, okay, why did Elijah go through all of this? Why did this test at Mount Carmel have to take place? Okay. It had to take place because the people, God's people, they knew the history. They knew okay, it, it, it was not Baal who rescued the people and, and led them across the Red Sea. Okay. It was not Baal who, who led Father Abraham through the wilderness. And, and made him a promise and, and, and gave him and multiplied his seed when he was in his old age. It wasn't Baal who, who, who protected Joseph in his, in his time there in Egypt. It wasn't Baal who did anything. God is the one, and the people knew this. Yet they, 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 they got so caught up with, with the world around them, and they chose the world around them instead of remembering what God had said and what God had done for them. Elijah had to come back and, and in this fantastic display, he had to show the people, God has never left. He's always been here and he's capable of, of doing all things. And you've ignored him. You keep ignoring him. How long, why, that's why he says, how long will you waver between two opinions? You're God's people. You know what God has done in the past, yet you want to follow the bows. I don't know, because that's what's popular, I guess. You want to do what's popular but you want to still act like you're God's people. This is the message that God has for you today. You're a follower of God. You know what he's done for you in the past. Stop what you're doing right now and think just today what he's done for you. 
okay? How he's looked out for you on the road, uh, on the street, at the supermarket, right there in your home while you sleep. You exist because of him. Now you're going to make all these plans and do all these things without him, without even involving him, the one who made you and gave you the breath that you breathe? How dare we do this to our God, Jehovah? God, and, and he's such a loving God that he's giving you yet another chance to come to him. Come to him, please. Now, whatever you were doing and planning on doing, just put the pause on that and come to him right now. Call out to him. Pray to him. Let's pray. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I pray that, that we would no longer keep juggling two paths, that we would pick one. You said you would rather us be cold than, than hot or cold than be lukewarm. Father, we've been lulled into a, a false sense of security, thinking we're okay and doing, you know, going to church and doing the motions and going through the motions of a Christian, but still playing with the things of Satan. Heavenly Father, have mercy on us. Thank you for giving us mercy one more time. Lord, thank you for calling us. We've heard your voice. Now we will make our decision and we'll follow you. Help us, Lord. Help us to follow you, I pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Family, thank you so much. Until next time, go with Christ.